Great. Well, it's uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be able to talk to Owner Gunterken. <laughs> Sorry, Gunterken. That's a tough, tough word to pronounce. A tough name to pronounce. Owner is easier. Um, yep. And thanks for finding the time. So the goal of this is because we don't have a live conference. The goal is just to sort of talk about your science, but but also a bit about your your background and your personal history and what your 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 what you do for fun, etc. To sort of take the take the role of what people would talk about over a glass of wine after your keynote talk. So that's what we'll try in some poor way to, to uh, reproduce. So yeah. um, can you just start by saying a bit about your personal background? Yeah, I'm happy to. So um, I am of Turkish origin. I was born in the beautiful city of Izmir in the west coast of Turkey. Then uh, when I was six years old, we moved to Germany. And then in Germany, I was in primary school and started high school. And then we moved back to Turkey again to Izmir. And there I finished high school. And after finishing high school, I thought of what to do as all young people do. And I was always fascinated in questions of mind and brain and animal behavior. So I thought psychology should be what I should study. And then I thought, hey, who invented psychology? It was the Germans, wasn't it? Wilhelm Wundt. So the Germans should know how psychology works. And since I was fluent in German anyway, so I thought I should uh, study psychology in Germany and here I am. Okay, so you studied psychology. What, um, what, how did you end up being a specialist on animals and animal cognition and the biological side of, of psychology? You know, it comes a, there are things you cannot choose because they, the choice is on the other side. They choose you. So animals choose me. So, and their behavior and everything, I was captivated by that from the beginning on. When I remember when I was maybe nine or 10 years old, I caught little bucks in the garden and then I put them into, you remember these little um, music cassette boxes? So I had these music cassette boxes and I constructed tiny little labyrinths into them. And then I rewarded these box to find a little piece of apple. And then I recorded their learning progress. And I made learning curves and memory curves. Wait, how old were you when you were doing this? Nine. I was nine or ten <laughs> about that time. Later wow. on, I studied uh, um, the color vision of my aquarium fish. So I um, started to look at my aquarium fish and uh, conditioned them to find um, fake worms or real worms. And I tried to create colored panels of the same grayscale. Well, this was not measured by pure eye. And I had two panels that were of same grayscale, gray but of different color. And they always confused these two, but they avoided the other one who was much more brighter and had another color. So my conclusion was fish can't see color, you know? Embarrassing, very embarrassing. But you know, that's how it started. So I thought that that's what I do and that's what I wanna do for the rest of my life. And again, yeah, here I am, that's what I'm doing. Wow, so you, I mean, many biologists start with a love of nature and going out bird watching, but you were already an animal psychologist at age nine. So that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this, this conference is on cognitive science and we have everything from linguistics and education. We have the full range of the cognitive sciences. Why do you think animal cognition is important in the cognitive sciences? For a couple of reasons. First of all, we, the animal homo sapiens, we study us. And then if we don't study other animals too, we either overgeneralize or undergeneralize. That's always a mistake that you have that you make. What, what happens very often is that we undergeneralize. We think, hey, look around. Who is the boss here on this planet? It's us, isn't it? So, and we are the boss because we can think, we have consciousness, we have language, and our whole brain is completely different from the other animals because of A, B, C, D, E. And that's wrong. But how do we know? We only understand this by studying other animals. And then we suddenly see that we undergeneralized under our cognitive conditions. And in the same way, we sometimes overgeneralize. 
when I have the feeling that I have a feeling what this guy feels in the next corner of the street, I may think all animals can do that, but maybe not all animals can do that. And many, many other things. That means we have to understand something that I call a pattern and, a, and an ornament. An ornament is we both wear something to cover uh, the upper part of our trunk, isn't it? And we have all of these little gadgets and et cetera. So all of these, this is something important. This is a pattern that insulates us from low temperatures. But, but I am having this and that and all of that. These are ornaments that can change over, over historical times. So you don't have that, but- uh, I'm not saying ornamented. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You are differently ornamented. So what is the pattern? What is the mechanism? And what is the ornament? How should I know without studying other animals? Mm -hmm. So I think to understand our own cognition, we have to look for non-human cognition. There is no other choice. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for cognitive neuroscience. So that's the only way. I don't know any other way of doing this. So we want to find the pattern so that we can understand what aspects exactly. of human cognition exactly. are the ornaments. Exactly. Are. What at the core is what we call cognitive operation and what kind of circuits are necessary. What are the abstract conditions of thought? For example, concerning working memory, there are so many commonalities in working memory in human and non-human brains. And all of that is related to something that is neural on the one side, but in an abstract way, cognitive on the other side. And it, the same is true for language. So what we call language in our way, what we call pre-language, I'm, I'm now on very slippery slope here, uh, what we call basic conditions of communication, what is common and what is different. All of these are, are matters of science that we only can understand with animal research. That's what I'm doing. Excellent, beautiful answer. I wanna bring up your, your book, not that new, 2018, but um, so once upon a time, it was believed when I was a kid that uh, only humans have a difference between the right and the left hemispheres. And you know, the right hemisphere is intuitive and musical and the left hemisphere is language, et cetera. But in the last couple decades, we've seen that that's really not true at all. So you must be very familiar now having written this beautiful book um, with what exactly is going on in lateralization in other species. So how, how would you say the field has changed and why is this important? Why is animal brain lateralization important? So if we are interested in cognition and brain asymmetry matters, because this is an important part of our lateralized cognitive system and it permeates all aspects of our cognition, but it also permeates all aspects of the neural organization of cognition. And there again, we make the mistake of thinking that we are the only lateralized animals, animal, and that's the reason why we are human. And now we know that asymmetries are so widespread, we haven't anticipated the, uh, how much widespread they are. We can trace them back to the Cambrium and even earlier conditions, even generalized bilateralia are asymmetric. We discovered, um, well, when I say we discovered, we dug out paleontological data that were interpreted by us and a few other scientists in a way that possibly the first right-handed animal existed in the Cambrium where there were no hands, but there were appendages where um, predators used mostly the right appendage hmm. to crack open the uh, trilobites. So it's a very long story, but why is it that way? And there are several reasons, and we can only find that out by really studying it in, in a widespread manner, because otherwise you again start saying, it's because of language, it's because of this or that. So if you look at it in a broad way, we suddenly understand there are different reasons and possibly the most important one is the two hemispheres specialized for two different cognitive operations. And we can do that at the very same time in parallel and so are much faster and are much more efficient. That brings about a lot of questions. How do these hemispheres communicate? And you can say, okay, that's easy. So they are the commissures, but then you look at the commissures and you realize that they can't produce the speed of communication that you need. So there's still a mystery open. How do we do that? 
Um, there are many more things that are very interesting and, and open yet. So we, for example, ontogeny, there seems to be a small set of genes that start the asymmetry of brains and bodies. However, you need a lot of environmental cues to fully, for the fully fledged asymmetrical system to emerge. So it's a tight interaction of environmental cues. If en environmental cues change, asymmetry is changing. And many things like that. And fascinating is also, and I learned this while reading a book, you know, when you come up with giving a lecture for a class for the full term, or when you write a book, you suddenly start reading much broader than you usually do. You, I suddenly realized that species go up and down with asymmetries. So when they turn into grass eaters, they lose their asymmetry. When they start being leaf eaters, they suddenly start being asymmetric again because the ecological conditions obviously create different selection pressures, promoting or not promoting asymmetry, many things like that. So these are new messages that accumulated over the last 20 years. It was great fun writing this book. Yeah. I, I, just out of curiosity, so everybody now in neuroscience is talking about predictive coding. How much do you think the solution to the problem you mentioned about the slow transmission speeds between the right and the left hemisphere is accounted for by the two sides predicting each other. So the left hemisphere actually predicting what the right will do and vice versa. I is think that, that, that? that's a great idea to come say really. And I haven't pitched it in this way. So thanks a lot. Um, I will think more deeply about that. Uh, we have one single unit recording experiment uh, that we conducted a couple of years ago. And that's the only one that goes into this direction in this field whatsoever in birds that do not have a corpus callosum, but a uh, anterior commissure. And indeed, each hemisphere tries not to inhibit or excite the other hemisphere, but tries to um, modify the speed of um, their ac activation peak of the other neurons. So they slightly slow down or accelerate the speed of the neurons of the other side. The beauty of that system is, and that goes along a little bit with predictive coding like properties in anticipating the own action. Are you in competition with the other hand or the other extremity, the arm, the leg, whatever? You slow down the speed of the other hemisphere. So the other hemisphere is simply slower in predicting and then comes too late. So it could be that I when I take this cup with my right hand and if there would be a, cup on, in my left hand, it could be that my left hand intended to grab that cup, but I will never know because I only consciously, list, consciously follow that what I do here, not knowing that 20 milliseconds were the gap that I had done something with the left hand. All of these are the beauty of this animal model. And if I do something with my both hands, then I can synchronize with the other hemisphere so that I do it with both sides. So possibly not inhibition or excitation, but slightly wiggling around with the timing of action potentials could solve some of these mysteries. But again, we are at the beginning at that point. Hmm. Cool, really interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you about another famous study that you've done that the uh, magpies self-recognition in the mirror uh, in magpies, which as far as I know, was the first bird to ever be um, shown to be able to do this. So, so how did that study come about and what do you think the consequences are? So the consequences were much wider than I anticipated. Um, again, we start with thinking that Self-recognition is only possible in a mammal, and it's only possible in mammals with big brains, dolphins and elephants and, and uh, apes. And even when these experiments were not done, I would say to the highest quality, we're very happy to accept them readily. But when it comes with an animal that you don't expect, then you of course you very scrutinize a lot how, how the experiment was done, which is good, which we should be, doing every time. So, and therefore it was a very widespread uh, resonance to this, to this discovery. What I think now about that is slightly in a different way. I assume that mirror recognition is much more widespread than we assume. 
Think, for example, of children in Kenya. When they are confronted with mirrors, they do not show until they are six or eight years of age any signature of self-recognition. So are Kenyan children unable to recognize themselves in the mirror? Of course not. Their environmental social conditions, why they don't do that, they are possibly more obediently um, raised and they think of signatures from the outside, from their parents, from elders that they should do something or not. We don't know, but if Kenyan children and European children would not be humans, but would be another species, we would say, okay, this group has no self-recognition and the other group has. We found that animals show signatures of self-recognition when we study them with machine learning because they behave differently in front of the mirror. And, and they show different signatures when they look through a glass and see another animal of their same species doing what they just did. But in the, and officially they have no self-recognition. I think self-recognition is much more widespread than we assume. So in magpies, we just were lucky enough to hit a species that showed the official signatures of self-recognition. I'm not sure what about bajerigars that behave socially to the mirror. I'm sure there are animals that don't recognize themselves, but possibly we underestimate the ability of many more species for self-recognition. And if this goes along with consciousness, that's another long debate. Right. Honestly, when I just give away my very personal thought, I think consciousness is also widespread, but to different degrees. And we have to understand that I should know a little bit about myself and about what I'm doing just now to survive in a world where all I'm bombarded with sensory stimuli and different things to do. And co consciousness is a matter of cognitive operation that is relevant for that. So you don't think that the, the Gallup test, so having a, touching a dot in, in the mirror is sort of the litmus test for self-consciousness? Well, it could be, but it, it's a test that produces a lot of false negative data. That's the problem. Right. I would say the majority of data in that is false negative. And we see it in chimpanzees. 90% of chimpanzees don't pass the test. So are they another race? Are they in, in, in mentally inferior? Of course not. They don't do this. That's all. They look into the mirror and say, hmm, not good looking today. <laughs> That's what I do every morning when I look into the mirror. They look into the mirror and think, hey, I kind of like that dot. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Great. Well, let me end by just asking outside of science. So when you're not so busy being a, a, a famous scientist, what do you do for fun? I think I'm a classic European in that respect. I love museums. I love travels. I love books. I have a very rich family life. A lot of friends, hang out with friends, having a beer. So a very rich private life. I cannot say I'm an aficionado of Mozart's last symphonies, nothing like that. Very broad, uh, broadly reading, a little bit too much science reading possibly. So I cannot get rid of that completely. But apart from that, yeah, I would say a classic European. Great. And do you actually take the weekends off? Well, I try. <laughs> yeah, me too. That's one of the big differences between the US and, and Europe. Well, great, owner. I mean, is there anything you want to add before we end? No, I just thank you for um, this very nice interview. And I see you're in your nice office. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward to this great conference. Yeah, we're looking forward to your keynote. Thank Thanks you. a lot, owner. Okay, bye-bye. Take see care. Bye-bye. See you in a couple of weeks.